The Old Testament lesson is Numbers chapter 11, verses 4 through 6. Listen for the word of God. The rabble among them had a strong craving, and the Israelites also wept again and said, If only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we used to eat in Egypt for nothing, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. The New Testament lesson is John chapter 6, verses 60 through 69. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But among you there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who were the ones that did not believe and who was the one who would betray him. And he said, For this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, many of his disciples turned away and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, Do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks, Valerie. Will you pray with me, please? Lord Jesus, we thank you for this reading of your holy word. We ask for your fullest blessing to be upon it. As we open our hearts and our minds to you, we pray that you would speak to us by means of your word and by means of your spirit. For we are listening for your voice today. And may my words bring you honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Perhaps this relationship of ours is doomed. Have you ever thought about that? It's it's very possible. Maybe this relationship that we have is doomed, doomed from the start. Many relationships are like that. Many relationships that start off really strong with great fanfare and great promise, they, they end up amounting to nothing. They last for a few months or a few years, and, and then they end doomed, we say. At the end of that kind of relationship, we say, well, it was doomed from the start. We should have, should have seen that coming. Perhaps this relationship that we have is doomed. What do you think? It deserves certainly some consideration. We have to allow for the possibility because, well, that happens, as I've said many times. Perhaps it's just all, you know, hopeless. Perhaps there's nothing that we can do. It's unavoidable. It's just going to, it's just going to end anyhow. These are the thoughts that cross my mind as I read the book of Numbers, just like we did this morning from Numbers chapter 11. It's the fourth book in the Bible, and many people who want to read the Bible from cover to cover, they get to the book of Leviticus, and then to the book of Numbers, and they run out of gas. They wear out, because the book of Leviticus is filled with a bunch of laws, and the book of Numbers is filled with a bunch of lists. But the middle of the book of Numbers from which we read this morning is also filled with a, well, it's filled with a whole bunch of relationship that's going on between God and his people. It's the continuation of this story of God redeeming his people. And it began way back in the book of Genesis chapter 12, where God chose one man named Abram He chose one man out of all the people of the earth. God chose Abram to build, to create, and to bless a new people. This man whose faith was credited to him as righteousness. God invested everything in Abram and all of his descendants. And the story continues. God blesses Abram and his children. God leads them into Egypt during a 
a terrible famine. He blesses them while they are in Egypt, even removing them, taking them out of Egypt when they had fallen into slavery for many hundreds of years. God did not forget them. He did not forsake them. Instead, with spectacular displays of power, the undeniable presence of God, he led them out of slavery through the waters of the Red Sea and into freedom. In there we join the story in Numbers chapter 11. And it is not going well. Because despite the fact that God had done all of these things, despite God, the fact that God had been faithful and trustworthy over all of those generations, the people of God, well, they like to, they like to, to complain against God. And in the book of Numbers and in other early books of the Old Testament, there is a cycle that starts to get established. God blesses his people. God does fantastic things for his people. And the people complain about it. Then God gets mad and God expresses that anger in in wrath. They repent and everything is better until about five minutes later when the people of God begin to complain again. God gets mad. He expresses his wrath. They they repent. It just goes on and on and on over and over again. When will it stop? Perhaps the whole thing is just completely hopeless, destined to fail. That is, that is what I consider when I read these very familiar stories. But it's not. It's not just a display. It's not just a, a proclamation of of people's uh, ability and tendency to rebel and complain against God that is still true to this day. These stories are, are not just a, a highlight of how we can rebel and remove ourselves from God. These stories are a proclamation of the unrel- unrelenting devotion that God has for his people, then and now. It is a display, it is a proclamation, it is a celebration of how God will not quit on his people under any circumstances. Despite the fact that we complain about how God goes about his business, God is still with us. Here we are. Jesus comes along thousands of years later. Thousands of years later, here we are after Jesus has lived his life and after Jesus has has taught his parable lessons to us and after he has died and has risen again, after the fact that his blood sets us free and forgives us of our sin. And we still are complaining, aren't we? And yet God is still here loving us, forgiving us, standing by us, leading us, protecting us, providing for us. No, these are are not stories about God's complaint department. These are stories that proclaim the fact that that God will not quit on us and, and never will. Do you see that? Do you hear that? And yet, and yet it does continue. In Numbers Chapter 11, we're told that within the camp that was following Moses and was following God, there was a a group called the rabble. I love that word, the rabble. And over the years, many scholars, many people have said, oh, well, those were people that weren't really part of the people of God. You know, they were out on the outer edge. They were just hangers on. Yeah, they they weren't included in the in crowd. You know, they were, they were half-breeds. That's what they've actually been called by many scholars. But that's a, a very, very poor, poor reading. Because when we read it that way, we say, well, it was the rabble that caused all the problem. It was the rabble that caused all the dissension. And that's a group of people that does not include me. That's a group of people outside of me. And we tell ourselves the same thing. Sure, there are problems in the relationship between human beings and God, but it's the rabble that's causing. And I'm not part of that. That's something over there, something apart from me, something that that I'm not guilty of and I have nothing to do with. That's a poor, poor reading. Instead, I want to ask you today, what part of you and what part of me is rabble? And what part of you and what part of me is doing the exact same thing that the rabble did back then? What part of you 
What part of me is sitting there complaining against God, even as God is blessing, complaining against God, even as God is displaying his power undeniably? What part of you, what part of me is complaining against God as if God has, has not done enough? What part, I wonder? Well, it says there in Numbers chapter 11 that it was the rabble that had a a strong craving. In other words, they had a strong appetite, right? They had a strong craving. That was the beginning of of the complaining. Oh, well, there it is, that that appetite within me, that appetite that that tells me that whatever I'm feeling right now, that's more important than what God wants. That's the rabble. That part of me, that appetite that says, whatever I I desire now most, that's more important than whatever God wants to bring into my life. That's that's the rabble, that appetite, that that appetite that says, whatever I'm feeling right now, well, that goes to the head of the line. That's more important than whatever God is doing and wants to do in my life. Yeah, I recognize that. That's the rabble. And it is not something that is outside of me. It's living inside of me right now. My don't think I'm the only one. That, but that's not where it ends. It's only where it begins. That part of me that, that likes to assume, you know, that's the rabble in me too. To assume that, that God is only here to obey my will, to follow my lead. That, that part of me that is shocked when God makes a choice that's different than, than what I would choose for myself. Yeah, that's... That's within me. That's, that's the rabble that complains against God, and it is very strong with, within me. How about you? It is that part of me that is, that is entitled. It feels entitled to, to be in relationship with God, but to have it always be easy, to never have it be challenging, to never ever have it be difficult. There, there is a part of me that, is, that assumes and feels entitled to always understand everything, to get For God to seek my approval before God will go forward. There is a part of me, and it is rabble in me. How about you? It was true then, and it is true now. It is that part of us that complains against God, even though God is sovereign. It is that part of us that complains against God under the assumption that we are not to follow God. We are to advise God. It is that part of me that doesn't want to be devoted to God, only God devoted to me and what I want. That is the rabble. That's the rabble that caused the problems in Moses' day in Numbers chapter 11. And it is the rabble that is inside of me that causes the same, same trouble. It is still very, very much alive for me, and perhaps for you, too. What do you think? It doesn't really, doesn't really change when Jesus comes along. I wish I could tell you that it did. And Jesus is obviously God in the flesh. He is obviously the Messiah. All of the things that he, he did, raising people from the dead, walking on water, feeding the 5,000, what is there not to get? The things that he taught, clearly he is the Son of God. And yet the rabble was still there. That part that complained, that, that part that, that wanted it to be easy. That part of us that wanted to be God instead of to yield to God was still there ready to welcome and to interfere and ultimately to reject the Lord. We know that when Jesus came, he used the phrase, I am, many, many times, memorably so. Seven distinct times, more than that, but Seven very memorable times. He came along and said, I am the light of the world. I think we hear that and we say, oh, great, that sounds good. Jesus is God and he is the light of the world. Oh, that makes me feel so good. Okay, I can handle that. I am the resurrection and the life, Jesus says. Oh, okay, yeah, I like that. That sounds good. I like the idea of resurrection for me and the people that I love. 
great. We don't have any trouble with that at all. I am the good shepherd. I am the gate for the sheep. Jesus talks about being a shepherd and that we are sheep. And, and we like that imagery. We love the idea that, that God goes and seeks the lost and that he protects us. Oh, good, God. Jesus has come and he is the good shepherd, the gate for the sheep. We like that. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. He says, I am the vine. You are the branches. And we love all of that. That makes sense. Abide in the vine. Follow where Jesus leads. Okay, that's, that's good. But when Jesus comes along in John chapter 6 and says, by the way, I am the bread of life. Now we have a problem. When Jesus made that declaration, no one was saying, oh, this sounds good, this sounds so warm and wonderful. No, not at all. When Jesus made the declaration that he is the bread of life, when he said those words, I am the bread of life, the people who heard it said, what in the world is this guy talking about? Has he lost his mind? And Jesus didn't stop there. He said, my flesh is real food, my blood is real drink. My flesh that I give you is the bread of heaven that leads to eternal life. People heard these words and thought he had lost his mind. It was at this point, as we saw in John chapter 6, that they didn't say, oh, this is great, the bread of life is here. They said, we're leaving, we quit, this is a hard teaching, we can't handle it, we won't abide it. And they walked away. Can you imagine that? Jesus is standing in their midst. They're looking him right in the eye. And we are told that many of his disciples, many of his closest followers, they abandoned him when he told them that he is the bread of life. And then he looked at his disciples, the remaining 12, and he looks at all of us today and he says, you want to go too? You want to go with them? Here's your chance. You want to leave? Is this your stopping off point? And Peter rises up for all of us in the midst of all of that moment. And he says, To whom shall we go, Jesus? Where are we going to go? There's nowhere else for us to go. You have the words of eternal life, he said. You are the Holy One of God. In other words, you're the Messiah. We've come to believe this, even though it doesn't always make sense following you, even though it is not easy following you, even though it's the hardest thing we've ever done in our lives. We've come to believe that you're it. You're the one. You, you are the son of God. Where else are we going to go? What else are we going to do? What else could possibly be better? Even though this is difficult and we quite often don't like it and it, it demands more from us than we can imagine. This is all that Peter was saying. We will not leave. We will stay with you. In his voice and in his comment, there's a, a certain exhaustion, isn't there? In his voice and in his comment, in his answer, there's a certain weak resignation. It almost sounds as if, as if Peter, if he had another option, any option at all, he and the others would take it. But there wasn't. Sometimes we can feel that way ourselves, can't we? We follow Jesus because there just isn't a better option. I think Jesus, he deserves better than that, don't you think? And that's why I had you pray the Lord's Prayer the way we did today. If you're watching online, if you are listening on the radio, I did a very unpresbyterian thing today, didn't I? I did not obey the order of worship in the bulletin. Presbyterians never do that. We're supposed to say the prayer and then go right into the Lord's Prayer, which we've memorized, which we've said thousands of times before, but not today. If you weren't here, if you weren't watching, if you're listening on the radio, I stopped and I challenged this group assembled here in the house of God. Before they prayed the Lord's Prayer, I told them to think about it. To think about every word of that prayer, every word that we've memorized, every word that we've known so well. Our Father who art in heaven. And then we say, what? Thy kingdom come, we say. 
Thy will be done, we say. We need to think about those words, don't we? We shouldn't just recite them from memory. We need to think about them. We need to feel them, the full weight of them. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And then we say to the Lord, give me this day. Give me just this one day in my daily bread. In other words, just give me one day, please. It's all I ask. Give me one day and enough bread, enough sustenance to get through that day. Not to fortify me forever. Not to make me into a, into a rich person, overflowing in abundance. May your kingdom come. May your will be done. And just give me enough to follow you again for another day. That is what we are asking. And we need to think about those words as we say them over and over again because these are the words of a person that God wants to have. It is a follower who has stopped complaining about how God does things. It is a follower who has yielded it is a follower who has surrendered. It is a follower who recognizes what a fantastic blessing it is just to be associated with Jesus Christ. It is a follower who prays that prayer even when it doesn't make sense, even when it isn't easy, even when we don't like it, even when we want to quit. It is a follower who prays that prayer in complete faith. And no matter where we are in the wilderness, God is good. And God will get us home. Hallelujah. And amen.